Welcome to Agribusiness with Dr. G. In this video, we're going to shift gears just a little bit. In the previous few videos, we were looking at a specific type of policy called a non-recourse marketing loan. In this video, we're going to look at a policy called a target price with a deficiency payment. So this is a target price with a deficiency payment. And here is the setup, and it's the same setup we always use. Let's move my face out of the way so that we can uh, work on this. Uh, as always, we're going to start off by drawing a market diagram. Let me change colors. Like all market diagrams, we're going to label the vertical axis with a P for price and the horizontal axis with a Q for quantity. And for good measure, we're going to name our market. This is the market for corn. We're going to have a downward sloping demand curve. We're going to have an upward sloping supply curve. And we're going to have an equilibrium price PE. And in this case, I'm not going to write PE. I'm just going to write the actual price observed in the marketplace, three. If you check the last video, it's the same price as before. Conceptually, imagine that this is the same supply and demand curve in the example that we just did. So dotted line down from the equilibrium to the quantity axis. <clears throat> and we're going to label that with 20. So this is 20 billion bushels of corn. And just like before, we've got this higher price of $3.30, but we're gonna call this price something different. This price is now called PT, where the T stands for target. This is the target price. And the way this policy works is the government sets up this scheme where they say to the farmer, we believe that you deserve $3.30 per bushel of corn, and we're going to pay you $3.30 per bushel of corn. We're going to guarantee that you will get that much for your corn. And here's how they guarantee it. They say, grow your corn. There's usually some limit to how much you can grow. These policies are very much tied together in very complicated ways. And the farmer says, great, I'm gonna get, I can get $3.30 for my corn, so I'm going to go from $3.30, and I'm going to draw a dotted line over. They don't actually draw a dotted line, but this is conceptually what happens inside people's heads when they think about this. And they say, well, at $3, you know, growing 20 billion bushels makes financial sense for me. But at $3.30, I go out to the supply curve, I draw a dotted line down, and I find a quantity supplied, QS, of 21 billion. And again, it's the exact same number in the previous example. Let's go ahead and label this QE and PE just so that no one's confused. And the way the target price with deficiency payment works is the farmer just harvests the crop and sells it out on the open market and gets whatever it is they get for it. And then the government says, let us know what you got for it. Well, they typically do something like a county average price. And the government says, we're going to cut you a check for the difference, and that is called your deficiency payment. So we have a target price with a deficiency payment. The tricky thing, the thing that most people learning this policy struggle with and stumble through is trying to figure out how much money does the farmer actually sell their corn for out on the open market when they get to harvest and sell it. Well, here's what they do. They have to sell it at a price that our consumers are willing to buy, buy it at. So we've got 21 billion bushels of corn, and now the consumer has to buy it, and the consumer has to see a price that they, that they can agree on, and we call that a market clearing price. We need the price that will clear 21 billion bushels from the market. So here's what we do. We start with our quantity supplied, and we go up to our demand curve, and we draw a dotted line over from the demand curve, and we find this new price. I like calling it PM, where the M stands for market. So this is the market clearing price. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to, technically I'm using the exact same elasticities from the previous example. So I'm going to set that up to $2.70. So that means uh, we've gotten a 10% a decrease in price to go with a 5% change in the quantity. So this is kind of interesting, and I've not ever kind of drawn the welfare impacts of this yet, so I'm going to draw those out before we do any of the math, so there's going to be multiple videos kind of showing this. So what I want to do now is switch colors, and I want to look at what this gains our producers. So um, we're going to try to find the change in the producer surplus, delta PS. And 
what we're looking for is this trapezoid here that is bounded by our supply curve because our producers are the suppliers. That means the same thing. That's the same height as the change in price going from the equilibrium price up to the target price that the, that the farmer is going to get. And then this is the length of the top of the trapezoid. This is the length of the bottom. So that green trapezoid is the change in the producer surplus. Now, remember what's going to happen here is they're actually going to sell it on the marketplace for 270 and then the government's going to cut them a check for the difference between 330 and 270 So let's go ahead and do the math for that since we've got the numbers right here in front of us. Let's see if I can zoom. Okay, let's see if, uh, I don't know how well you can see that on the screen, but we'll roll with it. So our formula is going to be equal to one half of P2 minus P1, and if you're keeping track of the story, P1 is the equilibrium and P2 is the target price, multiplied by our two quantities. It's going to be the equilibrium quantity and the quantity supply, Q1 and Q2. So the sum of the two quantities that we tell in the story. So this is going to be equal to one half of the difference between the two prices, which is this distance right here, and that is 0.3. Multiply by our two quantities, uh, 20 and 21, added together, 41. And that's going to give us the exact same number we got in the previous video. I think it was 6.15 billion, which kind of makes sense because in theory we have the same demand curves, uh, or the same supply curve, and we've done the same thing to the price. So the producers are going to gain 6.15 billion. And now here's the interesting part about this particular policy. So let me switch colors. We're going to now find the change in the consumer surplus. And again, the formula is very similar. It's negative of one half times P2 minus P1, the change in the price, multiplied by our two quantities, uh, Q2 plus Q1, close that parenthesis. And as we flip back, though, we need to go to the graph and we need to find the area that corresponds to the change in the consumer surplus. Now, remember, it's always bounded by the demand curve and it's always going to be the same height as the price change. But look what happened to the price change. The price went down. So this distance here is the height of our change in consumer surplus. Here's our demand curve. So we're going to go out to the demand curve. So... The bottom of the trapezoid is the quantity supplied, which is also the quantity demanded because that's how much the consumers, you know, consumed. And the height is our equilibrium quantity. There's only two quantities to pick from in this example because the quantity supplied is equal to the quantity demanded because it's kind of like this weird quasi-disturbed equilibrium. So we're looking for that trapezoid right there. So let's plug our numbers in. This is going to be equal to negative one half of 2.7 minus 0.3. And what I want you to notice is that's going to be negative when we're done. Multiplied by the sum of our two quantities, uh, 20, I almost wrote 40, plus 21. I was trying to step ahead. So that's equal to negative of one half multiplied by negative 0.3 multiplied by 41. And before we do any math, I want to point out to you that we've got a negative and we've got a negative. And when we multiply those two together, we're going to get a positive number, which is interesting. And it's a stark contrast to the previous policy. The change in the consumer surplus is going to be positive. So the cattle farmer, the ethanol grower, the person making corn syrup or whatever it is they're making out of this corn is now going to be able to buy the corn cheaper because of this particular policy. And so the end result is that their consumer surplus is going to go up. Now, remember that the people who are buying this corn are typically other businesses. This is like an industrial grade commodity we're dealing with here. Uh, this is something that's going to get milled and ground into corn mill, for example, if a consumer uses it. Most consumers will never touch corn like this. Most consumers are going to buy sweet corn. This is something that's used for animal feed and industrial processes. Uh, so let's plug the numbers in. Uh, negative one half times negative 0.3 times 41. I think it's symmetric. I think it's going to be equal to 6.15 billion. I'm going to say that, and then I'm going to do the math and double check. Yes, yes, it is. Um, there's no rule or law that says it has to be symmetric like that, but I just set it up that way here in the classroom. 
So our consumers of corn are now better off by 6.15 billion. This is an extra 6.15 billion in the profit in the next step in the supply chain. That's horrible handwriting. Let me write that again so you can actually read it. So that is 6.15 billion dollars of extra profit that's going to go to these businesses that are downstream in the supply chain. Or is it upstream in the supply chain? I don't know what direction supply chains flow. And what I want to point out to you is it's very different from the last policy. The last policy harmed the consumer to the tune of 5.85 billion. This time, the consumer is going to gain $6.15 billion. And so if you were to add the welfare together for these two individuals, you'd see a pretty sizable gain. But there's one more person we have to think about, and that person is the, the Treasury, right? What is the impact on the, the federal government? Or what is the cost of this policy to our taxpayers? So let's flip back a page. Let's take a look at our diagram. Let's think through it. So the way this plays out, is the farmer is going to go and sell their corn for $2.70 a bushel. And the government is going to make up the difference, which is this distance right here. All right? So 3.3 minus 2.7. And that is 0.6 or 60 cents. So the government says, go sell your corn for $2.70. I'm going to then give you $0.60 cents per bushel, right? And that is the deficiency payment part of this policy. So this distance here is the deficiency payment. So the government is going to dole out a deficiency payment of $0.60 cents per bushel. Well, how many bushels is the government going to, going to spend this on? Now, this, this trips up a lot of students because there's two options, right? There's the equilibrium quantity, and then there's the quantity the farmers actually produce. And, you know, bureaucratically speaking, what gets done is there's some county level average per acre multiplied by your, the number of acres that you've signed up for the program. It's really rather complicated. But ignoring all those complications for the implementation of the program, the government is going to have to buy this distance right here. They're going to have to purchase all 21, um, no, they're going to not buy, they're going to make a payment based on all 21 billion bushels of corn produced in the country. So this big red rectangle right here is the amount that has to be paid. That is the cost of the policy. So let me get to a clean page so I can write up the cost of the policy. Let's see here. So the policy cost, and again, you can consider this the taxpayer cost or the government cost or the amount of money the government has to borrow. The policy cost is going to be equal to the deficiency payment, we abbreviate that DP, multiplied by the quantity supplied when the policy is in place, because that's how many uh, bushels of corn the government has to make that payment on. In this case, it's going to be 60 cents multiplied by 21, uh, 21 billion bushels. So that's the cost of our policy. Now let's figure out what the impact is on the total welfare. So let's flip a page and let's do this. So the change in welfare is equal to the change in producer surplus, a positive number in this case, plus the change in consumer surplus. Again, it's going to be a positive number. In the previous policy, it was a negative, so we subtracted it minus the cost of the policy. So let's put all that together. That's going to be $6.15 billion plus $6.15 billion minus $12.6 billion. I'm not sure if I did that math on the last page, so I'm going to flip back and I'm going to write that math down real quick. So 0.6 times 21 is equal to... Uh, 12.6 billion dollars. All right, let's let's do the math. 6.15 plus 6.15 is 12.3 billion dollars minus 12.6 billion dollars. 12.3 minus 12.6 is equal to a negative 0.3 billion dollars. That is 3 hundred million dollars. 
The change in welfare is less than zero. It is negative. Welfare went down. Welfare went down. And so from an economic efficiency standpoint, this is not a good idea. This is an inefficient policy. From a Pareto improvement standpoint, you made two groups better off but made some other group worse off. A Pareto improvement is where you can make one person or group better off without making anyone else worse off. So you can't use the Pareto concept in order to say this is a good idea for a policy. What about the compensation principle? Well, um, you got two groups of winners and they both won a, a sizable amount of money and then you got this group of losers the, that had to pay the cost of the policy. And the cost of the policy isn't as large as uh, the amount of winning that came from the policy. So you actually end up with a situation where you can't apply the compensation principle. It won't work here. The winners didn't win enough to offset the cost of the policy. So when an economist looks at this and says, this is an inefficient policy, this is a drag on our society and is therefore probably a bad idea. But here's what I want you to look at. Let me switch colors here. Let's go with uh, a gray. If you were to go back in time and look at the last video and look at the change in the welfare from the non-recourse marketing loan, let me flip back a couple of pages because I wrote that down. The change in the total welfare for that was negative 6.3 billion. The target price with deficiency payment is negative 0.3 billion. And I was very deliberate in that I used the same supply and demand curves for both cases. And this is the thing that kind of rings true for this particular policy. The loss in welfare for this particular policy is always lower than the loss in welfare with the one that we just did in the last video. So this is a better policy. And if our goal is to keep looking for policies that are better and still achieve the objective, then this kind of makes sense. Now, one downside for this policy is the taxpayer expense. Now, it's difficult to, to compare these in the real world, but in this kind of contrived example, and in this particular case, this policy cost $12.6 billion. Let's see if I can find that here. All right, that's our, that's our taxpayer cost right there, $12.6 billion. The previous policy cost the taxpayers, let's see if I can find it here. It's on one of these pages. I just wrote it down a second ago when I recorded the other video. 6.6 uh, .6 billion. So the taxpayer burden on the previous policy is a lot lower. And that's one of those things that's kind of uh, important to look at. Um, you've got to balance all of these. Some individuals will look at these policies and say, pick the one that's going to cost the less. An economist looks at it and says, no, that's not what's relevant because the people winning from the policy pay taxes. Pick the one that's going to cause the least economic damage. And this second one, the target price with the deficiency payment, causes the least economic damage. That does not mean it's the one society will choose because some individuals in society would lobby, would argue that the one that cost the least amount of money to the government slash taxpayer is the better policy. Which one's the better policy? I'll let you decide. But the math is pretty straightforward. You know, d depending on what you want to use to define what makes the policy better is what leads to the answer. But the math is just, you know, it's just basic add, subtract, multiply, and divide arithmetic, right? So that's the end of this video. I'm going to hit stop right now and uh, start making the next one. So I'll see you in the next video.